Taking supplements as somebody with endometriosis can be an immensely helpful strategy for improving bloat, low energy, and pain symptoms. But are there any supplements we should be mindful of? Let's talk about it. Before we jump into today's video, please like this video, share it with a friend, and hit that subscribe button. Now, before I jump into talking about some supplements to approach with caution with endometriosis, keep in mind that many of the supplements that make my list today can absolutely be helpful. But when they are helpful or harmful is context dependent and or dependent on if you have a coexisting condition. All right, so the first one that makes the list is synthetic B vitamins. B vitamins are critical for energy nervous system support and hormone balance, especially estrogen and progesterone, but not all forms are created equally. Many cheaper multivitamins in prenatals or B complex blends use synthetic forms like folic acid, cyanocobalamin or pyridoxine HCL. These require enzymes coded by genes to convert them into active forms and if you carry a specific gene variant you may not process them efficiently. This can then lead to a buildup or leave you functionally deficient. For women with endometriosis where methylation detox and inflammation pathways are already stressed, choosing active forms like methylfolate, methylcobalamin or P5P form of B6 is often a smarter choice. The MTHFR gene is one you've probably heard of at some point on social media or through a healthcare provider. Studies do show that some MTHFR mutations are associated with endometriosis. The MTHFR gene makes an enzyme that converts folate into 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, the active form of folate used in methylation, breaking down homeocysteine, DNA repair, and neurotransmitter production. Neurotransmitter examples are things like dopamine and epinephrine. Methylation is like a switch that your body can turn on and off. It involves adding something called a methyl group to molecules in the body to help them work better. A few things that the body methylates includes estrogen, serotonin into melatonin, and arsenic so it can be removed from the body. Homeocysteine is a natural substance your body makes when it breaks down protein, but it relies on B vitamins to do this. If you have B vitamin deficiencies, it can build up and contribute to heart disease risk, infertility, and inflammation. You can test to understand what your genetic makeup looks like on a particular gene. This is called a genotype. I'm going to explain what a few of these different genetic makeups look like so you can compare them against your genetic results. A homozygous TT genotype in the C677T mutation, this is what you'd be looking for on a genetic test if you've had one done, results in only 30% of your MTHFR gene function. Whereas a heterozygous CT genotype in the same mutation results in 60 to 70% of your gene function. A heterozygous AC genotype in a a1298C mutation results in 80 to 85 percent of your gene function, whereas a homozygous CC genotype in the same mutation results in 60 percent enzyme function. I'm only giving you these details just in case you've had a genetic test done and you want to compare it against your results. Your MTHFR gene is like a recipe for an enzyme that helps your body activate folate. If you have the same letter for a specific genotype like we discussed a moment ago, it means you inherited a typo in that gene from both parents, whereas a heterozygous, where only one part of the gene is mutated, is inherited from one parent. To be clear, if you do not have an MTHFR gene mutation, you have the full capacity of your gene and you do not require active forms of B vitamins. However, you can't know if you have an MTHFR gene mutation unless you test for it. So often the cheaper, simpler alternative is to just supplement active B vitamins. Okay, the second supplement that makes the list today is DIM, which stands for diendylmethane. DIM is a compound naturally made in the body when we digest cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, or cabbage. DIM is often promoted as a natural estrogen balancer, but it's not a good fit for everyone. Let me explain. Have a look at the image on the screen. DIM is a very effective supplement for pushing estrogen down the green arrow towards the marker that reads 
2-O-H-E-1. This is the preferred less estrogenic estrogen breakdown product. However, look to the left of the 2-O-H-E-1 metabolite. There is another arrow there. The 2-O-H-E-1 metabolite needs to be made into 2-methoxy-E1, which is a water-soluble metabolite that relies on healthy MTHFR and COMT enzyme function. These two genes code for enzymes that require an adequate amount of methyl group donors like B vitamins, choline, magnesium, and SAMe to function properly. As we've established a few moments ago, the MTHFR gene mutation is more common in endometriosis patients, and this is often reflected in very low methylation on these tests, so specifically under 50%. If you are aggressively pushing estrogen to the 2-O-H-E-1 marker that you're seeing there in the image, but you can't shuttle it through to the next step, the 2-methoxy-E1, you are creating a buildup of an unstable DNA damaging molecule, i.e. the 2-O-H-E-1. This can build up making you feel worse. To take it one step further, let's assume you do detox estrogen well in the liver, but you don't detox it well through the stools. Constipation or slow motility through the bowel gives your body an opportunity to shuttle estrogen back into the body. If you are encouraging the movement of estrogen through the liver but can't remove it through the stools, you are also more likely to feel worse. In addition to this, DIM is highly effective at lowering circulating estrogen. For some women, especially those already struggling with low estrogen or who are trying to preserve ovarian reserve, this can worsen symptoms like hot flashes, low libido, egg quality, or vaginal dryness. If you do not know what your estrogen levels are or how you are eliminating estrogen through your liver and stools, I would encourage you to refrain from this risk. The best candidates for DIM are people who have high estrogen levels, poor 2-OH elimination, strong methylation, and healthy elimination through the bowels. Okay, the next supplement that makes my list is quercetin. Quercetin is a natural flavonoid with anti-inflammatory and mast cell stabilizing benefits, which sounds great for endometriosis, doesn't it? But quercetin acts on an enzyme that we have briefly already discussed in this video, COMT or COMT. As a quick reminder, COMT is the main enzyme that converts the 2-OH-E1 metabolite into the 2-methoxy metabolite pictured here on the screen. If you already have compromised methylation and you tack on high dose quercetin, you can make it worse and exacerbate estrogen excess symptoms. All right, the fourth supplement that makes the list is high dose vitamin C. Vitamin C supports collagen, immunity, and iron absorption. We even have studies that show high dose vitamin C taken together with vitamin E can help with pelvic pain, with pain with intercourse, pain with passing stools, and pain with urination. But in high doses, over two grams daily, it can act as a laxative, speeding up elimination through the bowels and causing diarrhea. Soft or unformed stools means you are losing nutrition that your body would otherwise have time to absorb. Simply taper down the vitamin C if this is the case for you, or try lower dose whole food sources like Camu Camu. All right, the fifth supplement that makes the list is high dose fat soluble vitamins. So specifically things like vitamin E, retinol, which is active form vitamin A and vitamin D. Fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E and K are stored in the body, especially the liver and fat tissue and can build up to toxic levels if taken excessively. Vitamin D, for example, is critical for immune health and endometriosis and endometrioma prevention, but too much can push calcium into tissues contributing to calcification or kidney stones. Furthermore, levels over 150 nanograms per mil or over 375 nanomoles per liter in the blood are considered toxic levels and this can lead to confusion, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, or heart rhythm disturbances. Generally, it is not recommended to exceed 4,000 international units daily. High dose vitamin A, the retinol form, can be dangerous in pregnancy and overburden the liver. You cannot exceed 900 micrograms of retinol activity equivalents daily or you should not. 
And while vitamin E has antioxidant properties, too much can thin the blood and increase bleeding risk during surgery. You may also experience fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, and muscle weakness with high doses. Because vitamin E is partially stored in the liver, high levels can also put an additional unwanted burden on the liver. All right, the next one that makes the list may surprise you a little bit because it's a supplement you hear a lot about in the endometriosis space as being very, very helpful. So NAC is one of the most promising supplements for endometriosis. Research shows it has the potential to reduce cyst size and improve pain symptoms. NAC is a precursor to making your body's a master inflammation fighter glutathione as well. Many practitioners also recommend NAC to fertility focused patients to improve cervical mucus quality and support egg quality. And while these things make NAC an excellent supplement to consider for most people, it is also a mucolytic, meaning it thins mucus. This, in addition to it being an acidic supplement, is often the reason why some people report irritation in the stomach when taking NAC, especially when taking it on an empty stomach. NAC is also a sulfur-rich supplement, which may not sit well for sulfur-sensitive individuals. You may be able to offset these effects by picking an enteric-coated form of NAC, lowering your dose, taking it with food, or breaking it up throughout the day. All right, the next supplement that makes the list, again, it might surprise you, and it's just generally probiotics. Probiotics are supplemental active bacterial cultures that have a positive transient benefit for you, the host. Probiotics can be a game changer for gut health, which is wildly important in people with endometriosis. But the type and context really matters. Some blends can worsen bloating, worsen constipation, or worsen histamine reactions. For example, Lactobacillus casei, Bulgaricus, Ruteri, Fecalis, and Thermophilus actively make histamine. Especially in the short term, it would be suggested that histamine-sensitive individuals avoid these strains. Co-conditions like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, large intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or candida may also cause you to react to certain probiotic strains that you otherwise might not react negatively to. The important takeaway is don't just pick a generic probiotic strain, pick one based on your needs and objectives. All right, supplement number eight on the list is magnesium oxide. Magnesium is fantastic for cramps, bowel regularity, nervous system support, sleep support, muscle cramping, and so much more. But magnesium comes in many different forms. The oxide form is not only the least absorbable form, but it also mostly acts as a laxative. Not only will you not be absorbing very much of this form of magnesium, it may also be unknowingly loosening your stools, causing gut lining irritation, inflammation, and even deficiencies if the side effects are bad enough. So opt for a glycinate, malate, or even citrate form based on your unique goals in place of magnesium oxide. And definitely check any blended products that you're taking in case you suddenly started noticing changes in your digestion or your stools when starting a new supplement that might contain magnesium oxide. All right, number nine on the list is antimicrobials. So things like berberin, oregano oil, neem, Natural antimicrobials like berberin, oregano oil, and garlic are all the rage right now. Put your hand up if you've heard berberin being referred to as nature's ozempic. While antimicrobials like berberin have fantastic benefits for blood sugar balance, ecromancia support, and insulin support, it's not selective, meaning it can wipe out beneficial anti-inflammatory bacteria as well as harmful ones. Long-term use can damage gut integrity, which is already vulnerable in endometriosis. Bottom line, make sure you're being guided when using these natural antimicrobials and immediately discontinue if adverse effects arise from their use. Okay, supplement number 10 on the list is iron. The last supplement to approach with caution that I wanna talk about is iron. Many studies show how excess iron intake or excess measurable levels of iron in ovarian endometriomas and the fluids surrounding the abdominal organs is linked to excess oxidative stress in people with endometriosis. Oxidative stress refers to higher amounts of DNA damaging inflammatory chemicals compared to inflammation fighting 
anti-inflammatory antioxidants. This excess iron controlled oxidative stress was shown to generate inflammation and affect fertility and symptom severity. While excess iron has been shown to be problematic, iron deficiency due to heavy menstrual bleeding is also more common in the endometriosis population. Because the thyroid, egg health, oxygenation, and more rely on healthy levels of iron, deficiency is also not a preferred state when living with endometriosis. The bottom line here is is don't supplement high dose iron without relying on a comprehensive blood panel to guide you. And no, ferritin is not enough. Have your serum iron, total iron binding capacity, percentage saturation, and ferritin tested. Have these levels tested annually if you are supplementing iron to ensure your levels remain within optimal ranges and don't swing too high or low in either direction. Ferrous shell form iron is best absorbed and tends to produce the fewest adverse digestive symptoms. So try and pick this form if it's accessible to you. So here's the takeaway. Supplements can be powerful allies in managing endometriosis, but they're not one size fits all. More isn't always better and the wrong type or dose can backfire. If you're considering supplements, especially ones we talked about today, it's best to work with a professional who can look at your lab symptoms and personal history. If you found this helpful, make sure to like this video, subscribe for more endo nutrition tips and let me know in the comments, which supplement are you currently taking that you're now curious a bit about? I'll see you in the next video.